On the important news, we have a new website uh, that uh, has been uh, redone to match all state agencies' website. Uh, if anybody w was familiar with the, with the system that uses, it's a, that uses a Drupal system, that means it's compatible with the tablets and laptops, so you don't have to reconfigure uh, the screens. It'll do it automatically. It's a lot more user-friendly. And, uh, and best of all, now you can search for documents in our website. So if you're looking for certain documents, there's a search button. And I think a lot of people, a lot of questions that we get is about those documents. <laughs> Next, uh, I would like to uh, inform everybody that we have two important documents that have been revised and they've been a long time coming. Uh, the first one is the roofing guidelines that was dated, the last one was dated in 1988. And the most important one is the state construction manual, which has been updated and it's on, online right now. And uh, that manual has been revised to include all the legislative uh, news and, and recent uh, changes. And it has all the links that are uh, linked to current uh, websites. It is scheduled. Uh, uh, with one file, so you can download it as a PDF. Also, you can do searches within the manual. Uh, it has a, a uh, table of contact that is linked to all the documents within it. And as you might know, uh, we have started the Interscope Plus, um, and we're, right now we are in phase two uh, for Interscope Plus, which is the integration with the Primavera. And that is coming uh, mostly from, from the end users and the owners university for, to uh, uh, manage their projects and, and help us with some reporting that is needed. And also we'd like to announce that we are running a uh, um, concurrent lab that is uh, just across the, the hall to the left, the left of me. Uh, it, is, it is manned by Mike Jewelli, uh, Joey Ennis, and Carol Ersag. If you have any questions about Interscope, logons, accounts, information, uh, please go see them. They have laptops and computers set up so you can help you. And lastly, but not last, uh, I'm pleased to announce effective April. Uh, the Department of Administration has announced a new director for the State Construction Office. Uh, so please help me uh, welcome uh, our first speaker. Uh, he is the chairman of the State Building Commission and the new State Construction Office, uh, Mr. Kent Jackson. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, this is uh, quite uh, coincidental timing, but it's, it's great. Um, I have enjoyed working with you through the State Building Commission, and I certainly look forward to working with you uh, in the State Construction Office and working more closely with that staff. Uh, I can promise you we will continue to be uh, a nimble staff and be responsible, be responsive to, uh, to your needs related to construction and be very customer focused. So I look very uh, forward to that uh, starting uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, working with you in that capacity. Uh, before I talk about the State Building Commission update, I wanted to uh, recognize and thank a couple of uh, uh, folks here today that, that, that are with us and some will be participating. Uh, we have with us this morning Representative Dean Arp, who has been uh, very supportive of, of construction and uh, State Building Commission and all of our efforts along those lines, so thank you for being here. Um, also this morning, uh, we have the Acting Secretary of the Department of Administration, uh, Catherine Johnston, is with us. Uh, thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, the Deputy Secretary, uh, John LaPenta, uh, will be making some remarks uh, after me this morning. Um, so regarding the State Building Commission, it is a very exciting time for the State Building Commission. Uh, we have been actively for the last, uh, particularly the last six months, uh, focused on, uh, number one, preparing for the uh, Connect NC bond package uh, that everyone knows was uh, very successful uh, last week. So we're very excited about uh, delivering those projects to the state. Uh, we've also been uh, kind of uh, refocusing on the Building Commission as an organization uh, where we need to focus our efforts to help the construction community the most. 
And one of the most important things that, that we have been doing related to that is to address some of the project delivery and financing methods that have, have been on the books as far as law is concerned for, for some time now, but have, you know, have not really been fully defined. So uh, last month, we created uh, three subcommittees that will be working on these delivery and finance methods. And those three committees will be looking at the design build delivery method. Uh, we'll be looking at the uh, public-private partnership uh, financing method. And we'll be looking at the pre-qualification requirements for construction contracts. So I appreciate the, the support and the work of the building commission members. And I'd like to recognize those that are attendants today. Now, Aaron Thomas is here at the front. Aaron is the vice chairman, has been um, very supportive and a great leader on the building commission. Uh, Roger Woods is here as well. He's a uh, member. He'll be giving a presentation later. Uh, other members, uh, Mike Benson, I know is here this morning. Uh, Susie Lewis, I'm not sure if Susie is here, but she's also a member. Uh, Rick Whitaker is a member. Uh, Blair Bordeaux is another one of our members. Um, and uh, Matt Messick. So uh, thanks to all of you. I've really uh, been enjoying working with you. You're a great group. Uh, they're really uh, a talented group that is committed to uh, moving the construction efforts for the state forward, and it's uh, a pleasure working with them. So with that, that is uh, you know, my update for this morning. I'll be seeing you certainly uh, around the room today, and once again, I look forward to working with you as the director of the State Construction Office. Our next speaker is uh, he's going to give us a, an update on Project Phoenix. Uh, please help me welcome Mr. John LaPenta, our Deputy Secretary for Department of Administration. Thank you, Latif, and thank you for your service as the interim director. And I look forward to working with Kent starting in, in April. Um, as I look out in the audience, I know a lot of people here have been very supportive of the bond. So on behalf of the governor and the state of North Carolina, I want to thank you for your support. And as you all know, last Tuesday, we were very, very successful in the passage of the uh, bond, which will be very, very beneficial to the state of North Carolina. So. Again, on behalf of the governor and the state of North Carolina, thank you for your support on that very important initiative. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Project Phoenix. And I'm not sure how many people are familiar with Project Phoenix, but it's an initiative that was started by the governor about a year ago. And I was brought on specifically about seven months ago to, um, to orchestrate and, and run and implement Project Phoenix. And basically what we're trying to do is shift the paradigm on state construction, state real estate, and taking one of the most valuable assets the state of North Carolina has, its land, its property, its real estate, and leverage that and change the way the state does business when it comes to office buildings, the use of property, the layout of property, and trying to make it more efficient and uh, in the long run really have some good quality real estate for not only the residents of North Carolina, but as well as the workers who work for the state. Uh, Project Phoenix, what we're looking at, it's just not, the main focus currently is the um, government complex in downtown Raleigh and some of the uh, corridors, but it's a statewide initiative. We're looking at real estate throughout the state uh, to really better leverage it and use it to our advantage. Uh, as you know, in the government complex, right around the, the capital region, uh, from the state capital all the way down to P Street, there's a lot of pieces of property there that, number one, are underutilized. Uh, number two, they need a definitely remodel of, uh, of what's going on. So, um, which one? Right here. So th this is the state complex, which I think most people are familiar with. That's our main focus, but not our only focus. 
Um, and you can see some of the old buildings that we have. Oh, that's the st state records building that you can tell. I mean, here it is, is in the capital region. It's not a very attractive building. I mean, it's a usable building. It serves its function, but it's not a very attractive building. Um, so we, so we, what we decided to do was uh, is prioritize some of these office buildings and some of these sites to, uh, to leverage the assets. So as you can see, uh, these are probably our top nine priorities. And what I'll do during the presentation is just kind of go through these priorities and tell you what we're trying to do differently than what the state normally does. Uh, the first thing were the Blunt Street houses. These were 12 or 13 mostly historical homes on Blunt Street that over a 10-year period, 30 years ago, the state bought. And the state, in, in most instances, just let them deteriorate. Uh, they didn't put any money into it, and these beautiful homes that are some over 100 years old were just deteriorating. So the governor decided that we needed to sell these homes and have the private sector uh, fix them up and bring them back to the uh, past uh, uh, glory. And I'm here to say that uh, all but one home has been sold to the private sector that brought in around $7 million to the state of North Carolina. Uh, it saved us from spending money to um, uh, upfit these homes. And another win is that the city of Raleigh currently has, will have a tax base of seven to $8 million, where in the past, since these were state-owned properties, the state collected no money. So to me, this was a two-inch putt that was uh, successfully uh, executed and uh, most of these, like I said, uh, so far we only have one more home on the market to sell, and we just put these homes, uh, uh, you know, we, we were able to do this in the past six months. Another big win is the personnel training center. And I know that it's been a philosophy of the state to acquire real estate, not sell it or lease it. But right here you have the personnel training center, which is, uh, it's about a 12,000 square foot building, very old, probably 50, 60 years old. It's on prime real estate between uh, Peace Avenue and Vaughan Avenue. It currently ha houses 12 individuals, and it is now, uh, we're doing a 99-year ground lease. We have an incredible, incredible amount of interest in this piece of property to, uh, for a 99-year ground lease. So our intention is to uh, execute a 99-year ground lease with this piece of property have the developer come in, put, uh, um, put a new, uh, new project there, and again, this is a win-win. The state will um, get a, a nice windfall on the, lease le on the uh, yearly lease payments. Uh, in addition, you, again, you have a piece of property that has a zero tax base for the city of Raleigh, and now they'll have a nice uh, developer on there uh, where they can again collect taxes on that valuable piece of property. We have... Um, the Old Rex Hospital. Currently, Old Rex Hospital uh, houses the Employment Security Commission. And as you know, this hospital is over 100 years old. It's on around 15 acres of incredibly valuable real estate. It's right be it, you know, it's right be uh, between uh, Cameron Village and the uh, downtown area of Raleigh. It's probably the largest track of undeveloped land that's out there. And it currently houses the Employment Security Commission. And the Employment Security Commission does a very vital job for the state of North Carolina, but they don't necessarily need to be on that most valuable piece of real estate. So our intention is, again, to do a 99-year ground lease and market it with a private developer and then move the Employment Security Commission to some place that has uh, uh, where real estate is uh, a little less expensive. And again, we're not going to build a new headquarters for them. We're going to go out in the private sector and either lease some space for them or if necessary, do a lease to build, uh, we're not gonna own that piece of property. So we're changing a mindset from uh, a capital budget where the state either uh, appropriates money or they do a bond issue to build a new headquarters to an operating expense where the state would pay lease payments. And you know, th this old Rex hospital literally was an old hospital so you have offices that were operating rooms, that were patients' rooms, that were doctors' offices. Very, very inefficient. It cost a fortune for operations and maintenance of this facility. So going forward, we're going to develop that. Get a, you know, that's a very valuable piece of real estate, and and move forward and and move the Employment Security Commission 
uh, to a better piece of real estate that they can operate more effectively and efficiently. I think uh, this is another one, Charlotte Prison. As I said, a lot of the property is here in, in Raleigh, but there's other pieces of property that are uh, across, the straight, uh, across, across the state that are very valuable. The Charlotte Prison is a little less than 50 acres. It's less than two miles from the airport, uh, and the prison was closed four years ago, and it's just sitting there idle. And so we, um, a couple months ago, we, uh, we put it on the market, and historically, pieces of property like this, the state tries to sell themselves. But this piece of property is so valuable that we've decided to hire a broker. We've hired, hired a broker. We have uh, CBR Richard Ellis, and they're going to start marketing the project, uh, the property. And we decided that since this piece of property is so valuable, that it'll have nationwide interest. And the best way to do that is use a nationwide broker. So currently, uh, this property is for sale, and as is. And instead of doing a 99-year lease on this spe uh, specific piece of property, uh, we're, we're selling it fee simple because it's kind of outside of the uh, uh, metropolitan area. It's out by the airport. Uh, we figured it, we might as well do it fee simple and we'll get a higher fee for it. Uh, most of the properties that we're selling, and I use the word sell or putting up uh, out to market, will be 99-year leases because uh, there are, since they are so close to the capital region, well, we want the opportunity in 100 years to, to have the property revert back to the state. Blue Ridge property, I think um, everybody's familiar with this. Again, this is approximately 30 acres of land. Uh, the, what we're trying to market, there's three things. You have the mail center, you have the Department of Instruction um, uh, uh, book depository, and you also have fleet maintenance out there. Again, all very important functions of the state but do they need to be on the, some of the most valuable real estate in the city of Raleigh? You know, the Department of Instruction, you know, that, that warehouse, you know, can go anywhere. It can go out in Johnston County. It can go someplace where the state pays $1.50 a square foot to store whatever needs to be stored there. Fleet maintenance, as you all know, under uh, Secretary Johnston, uh, we are uh, privatizing that. So that function is not going to completely go away but it's certainly going to get a lot smaller. We can find another uh, space for them to do their job, and as well as the mail center, which uh, has to be close to the city of Raleigh, but it doesn't need to be on the most uh, valuable piece of real estate in the city. So what we're trying to do here is we're going to go out. Again, we're, going, we're in the process of selecting, selecting a broker. We want to go out. We want to do a public-private partnership. And what does that specifically mean? We're wide open for a public-private partnership. We're going to let the market dictate how we do it. Uh, the state may be an active investor in whoever the developer is by using the land as our equity and, and forming a true partnership with the developer. We just might do a plain old 99-year lease where we just lease the property and let the developer do whatever they want, and all we do is collect uh, yearly uh, lease payments. But we really want to go out there. We want to market it. We want to uh, use a third-party broker and let the market decide what the best use for that property is. This is a lot 18 parking lot. This is a four, this is a four acre parking lot right across from the Department of uh, Cultural <laughs> Resources, catty corner to the governor's mansion. Um, and currently this is four acres. Again, unbelievable, valuable piece of property. And it's a surface parking lot. You know, there's a lot more that we can do with that than park cars there. And one of the um, initiatives that the governor wants to do is he wants to bring density to the capital region. And how do you bring density? You do it by having hotels, uh, multifamily residency, be it condos or apartments, um, uh, multi-use uh, uh, retail. You know, you bring, you bring density to that region, and what you do as everybody knows, come 5 o'clock in the capital region, you know, it's a ghost town. So by bringing density, it, it just kind of starts to snowball. You have uh, more housing, you have uh, hotels, that brings more restaurants, that brings more shops, and people stay past uh, 6, 7 o'clock in the evening. And again, this is an unbelievable value, valuable piece of real estate. We want to get all the stakeholders involved in the decision of what we do with this piece of property. But again, we want to develop it. Uh, we want to be partners in the development. We want to be public-private partners. 
Uh, if that means that they build a high-rise office building and the states takes, you know, takes the first four floors, you know, does it mean we become an equity partner by, again, by leveraging the value of the land into the partnership and try to mitigate some of the uh, downside? Uh, but we truly want to take, shift the paradigm from the state only owning our office buildings to, in some instances, you know, does it make sense to lease these properties? I think, and then this, this is the big one. Um, as you all know, the city, the state sold Dorothy Dix to, um, to the city last June. So the clock is ticking. HHS needs a new headquarters. And they need approximately a, a million square feet. And that million square feet is going to probably cost between 350 to 450 million dollars to build a new headquarters. You know, number one, so the state can do three things. They can pass a bond to pay for the new headquarters, which I don't think is going to happen anytime soon. Number two, the General Assembly can appropriate $400 million for a new headquarters. And again, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Or number three, we can kind of think outside the box and maybe do a lease to build, uh, do some sort of public-private partnership uh, to finance this and just do an operating budget as opposed to a capital budget of over $400 million. So what we're looking to do here is consolidate all of HHS into one campus where it makes sense, as many, um, as many outside leases and current headquarters into one location, uh, find a nice piece of state property where we can uh, put that on there and do some sort of public-private partnership where we do a lease to build. Um, and again, they would build to our specs so the state would still have control on the quality of the office building and exactly what we need. It would be some sort of campus, maybe four or five buildings, depending on what makes sense, both financially and operationally. And we move over to there. So you have state-of-the-art facilities for the employees. You have um, maintenance and operations, which in, currently is being, um, in most instances, you know, that's an easy cut for the General Assembly, right? You, you can always cut maintenance a little bit. You can always cut operation budgets a little bit. And the buildings deteriorate where, you know, they go from Class A to Class C fairly quickly if you don't pay for the up cut, upkeep. But in, it, in this instance, in this, uh, in, in this uh, delivery method, you know, you have a third party that owns the, uh, the building, and they're responsible for the upkeep and the maintenance. So, again, it, it's a win-win, but it's a paradigm shift from capital budgets to operational budgets. Uh, and again, you know, one of the things we're looking at is some of the functions, Department of Revenue, they have a beautiful building in the capital region, uh, but maybe a lot of their functions doesn't necessarily need to be where it's located. You know, they do a lot of process, so maybe you can move 60% or 70% of some of these employees that do an important function, but not necessarily they need to do it right downtown. So maybe you, you move some of those uh, uh, employees to uh, outside of the 440 perimeter, and then that opens up additional office space. And um, they can, um, so you don't have to build a new building. You become more space efficient. Another issue that we're trying to do here, and again, it just makes, um, it's efficient. You have more square, which is a, a square right smack in the middle of, um, in Raleigh, uh, the city has offered, and they passed uh, the money to to put $12 million into Moore Square to uh, again to uh, put some restrooms there, to redo the park, to re-landscape it, to have a food kiosk, and it just got caught up in the bureaucracy because the state owned the the state owns the uh, Moore Square, but the city was going to pay for the uh, for the upfit. So you had a little bit of uh, a conflict there. And again, they needed some easements. Uh, Department of Administration, working with the governor's office, working with the, uh, uh, the city of Raleigh, we were able to give them that easement. At the same time, the city of Raleigh is gonna spend $12 million to upfit the park and construction's gonna start this fall. So again, this was something, uh, just a simple solution that the governor saw that there was a bottleneck and you just needed to move along with the bottleneck. Um, again, Blunt Street, it just kind of shows that uh, while having these homes being empty and not, um, uh, and nobody living in there, you know, just the surrounding areas deteriorated. 
as the city now has a tax base on these homes, these sidewalks are going to be, um, to be fixed and it's just gonna uh, improve the quality of life. And one of the reasons this is so important is that this neighborhood is right next to the governor's mansion and it's noticeable. You know, the governor takes a walk every evening or most evenings and you just see, you know, these homes were deteriorating, the sidewalks weren't in great shape and by doing this, by trans transferring these homes to the private sector, this whole area is going to uh, blossom again. And what we're looking at, the model, and, and I think one of the reasons why Project Phoenix makes sense now, and as I tell people, is North Carolina is growing. We're now the ninth largest state in the nation, and we're coming close to overcoming Michigan in the, uh, uh, in the size of the state. People are moving to North Carolina. We have real estate is valuable here. You know, what we're trying to do here in Raleigh, you probably couldn't do in Albany, New York, or Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, just because you don't have the growth and you don't have the value of the real estate. You know, Nashville is doing the same thing. They're taking a look at their real estate. How, to le how do you leverage that real estate uh, to the state advantage? How do you use the equity of that real estate to move ahead? And you're changing the paradigm from the state owning all of its office buildings and real estate to maybe there's a second way of doing it, which is more cost efficient and brings a better product and, and maybe cheaper operating and maintenance cost. Perfect example, I think, you know, of, of ways that we don't want to do things is the Albemarle Building. Uh, and I know, uh, you know Albemarle Building is another building. It was built in the 60s. It's uh, an old building. Uh, I don't think it's a very attractive building, and yet the state is paying $42 million to refurbish it. And I know I, I saw some people from Barnhill. They're doing a great job on this building. They're a great general contractor. LS3P is the architect. They did a great job with it, but it's still a 40 to 50 year old building, and they're going to refurbish it. Department of, of Insurance is going to move into it, but you know that, that's not the best looking building, and it's going to still look the same. You know, ideally, in this, new, in this new vision, I would have loved to torn that building down, put a hotel there, and then, um, and then maybe found a, a lease to you know, build a lease or something like that for the Department of Insurance uh, and, and move forward. So this is, you know, this is the paradigm that we don't want to be part of anymore. Uh, same thing with uh, the State Administration Building. You know, this building, again, was built in the 60s, terribly inefficient. If you look at the layout, if you look at the office space per uh, full-time employee, it's like 400 square feet. We're in the private sector, it's less than 200. And so what we're thinking of do, doing is, um, as we move, if Department of Revenue, their employees move, that opens up space. You can move the Department of Administration and everybody else who's housed in that building to the Department of Revenue. And then that opens up another four acre lot you demo this building, and again, you have four acres that the state is then able to do uh, uh, some sort of public-private partnership and to develop this very valuable four-acre lot of land and move, uh, move everybody there into the Department of Revenue, and again, in more efficient space that's, uh, number one, is cheaper to operate for both uh, operation and maintenance, and maintenance cost. So um, th this is a perfect example of, of where we want to go forward. So that's pretty much it. Like I said, there was a lot there, it, a lot of moving parts, but uh, we're hoping to announce some, uh, some quick wins in the next week or so of some uh, public-private partnerships. So uh, I appreciate your attention and uh, enjoy your conference. Thank you.